in the blank. You're not getting any younger. So. So I would say never stop learning. Hey, you. Yes, you. Welcome to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast, a podcast for people who want to disrupt their lives for a good reason, to make it count. I'm your host, Jen Glantz, and every week I'll drop a new episode with stories from real people just like you who woke up one morning and decided to make big changes, starting with small things. We'll cover topics like entrepreneurship, love, failure, and self-care. Hey, you're not getting any younger, so let's make this an adventure. Ready? Hey, hey, any youngers. It's me, your host, Jen Glantz, back with another episode of the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast. It's been a while since I've had a roster of guests on my show. I've been doing a lot of solo episodes because I just felt like I wasn't going to set any type of cadence for how many guests I was going to have. I just wanted to have on awesome people. And if I didn't have an awesome person to have on the show, well, I would just spill advice for you and to you. But I have the next couple episodes coming out are all back to back, incredible women, incredible guests. And today's episode, I know maybe by the title, you're like, I don't know if I want to listen to this. Tax season is over. But I promise you, today's guest, Katie Gallo, shares so many incredible tips about your finances, about taxes, about things that you haven't thought about but maybe you start you should you should start thinking about them I met Katie because Katie and her family at the Gallo Group have been doing my bookkeeping and my taxes for so many years. They make it so easy for me, and Katie is somebody who's just become such an incredible person in her own way, in her own mindset, and how she takes care of herself. And I'm excited for you to listen to a lot of Katie's tips, not only about finances, but just about life and self-care in general. If you want to learn more about the Gallo Group, check them out. They offer financial solutions for bookkeeping, tax prep, payroll, and so much more. I love them. I adore them. And it's worth having a conversation with them if you have always wanted to figure out your finances, your taxes, but have always felt scared. They are the least intimidating people in the world. You'll see more about that when you start to listen to Katie. I can't wait for you to hear this episode. I'll be back next week with a brand new one. All my love, Jen Glantz. Today's podcast is brought to you by Thinkific. Thinkific is the number one platform to create, market, and sell your own online courses or membership sites. They have revolutionized how individuals earn and learn online by building an all-in-one platform designed for both course creators and their audience. Try Thinkific for free today at try.thinkific.com slash Jen Glanz. That's try.thinkific.com slash Jen Glanz. You are going to love it. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I'm very excited to be on your podcast. I am so excited that you were on today. And I want to start off with the first question I ask everybody on the show, which is, how would you describe who you are and what you do to a person you just met at a party? All right. So my name is Katie Gallo, and I am an accountant and a tax preparer. Um, Most of the time um, when you tell people you're an accountant, when you're in public, they either don't care or they ask you a hundred tax questions that you cannot answer not knowing them. So um, yeah, and I, so I specialize more in small service-based businesses and with a more specific focus on solo entrepreneurs who are looking to make the transition to S-Corps or are already S-Corps. You know, it's so funny because I have been guilty of saying I'm an accountant when I don't want to talk about bridesmaid for hire. <laughs> so I'll just be like, I'm an accountant. But I'm also guilty of asking accountants like a thousand tax questions. Is there any that annoy you or are you just like, oh man, these are just so complicated to answer at a party? That's really what it is mostly is like someone will ask me a question and they're like, I have this. And so what do I do? I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know. Because most of the time they can't even like describe what it is to me in the right way. So like they'll say they got a letter and they're like, this letter said this. And I'm like, okay, send me the letter. And then the letter says something different. And I'm like, okay, so reevaluate. So, um, yeah. And now I guess there's something on TikTok that like being an accountant means something totally different. 
So when I say I'm an accountant, they're like, oh, so you're a spicy accountant. I'm like, no, the boring one. <laughs> Wait, I, I love that it is a TikTok trend. I have seen that. I feel like my go-to question when I meet an accountant, and this is so annoying, is like, hey, can I write off my apartment? And they're like, it depends. Like, why? You know, I just like, I'm like, I have to stop asking that. But it's my favorite question to ask because yeah, everyone, has like a, but everyone has a different answer, you know? Yeah. So, I guess you can. I don't know if I ever have. Well, Katie would know because Katie has been doing my taxes. <laughs> we can, girl. And we can talk about that when we get into your stuff. Um, you know, only for self-employed business owners, which you are. So um, I do get a lot of questions from W-2 workers about what tax deductions they can take. And I'm like, unfortunately, none. That's that's reserved for the small business peeps, which is an incentive of owning your own business. Well, that is something that I like to hear because... Yeah. You know, that's a common question that I think a lot of New Yorkers ask who are like, how can I get a rent discount? But okay, you said you weren't a spicy accountant, but you do brand yourself as a cool accountant. And I want to talk about that because you're right. Accountants have like a bit of a reputation. Also, like when you think accountant, you think man and you are not a man. So I want to talk about why you call yourself the cool accountant. Yeah. So the cool accountant kind of started when um, I first kind of started working and being a a large complaint that I was hearing from clients who transitioned to me were that their old professionals were very unapproachable, kind of cranky. They would get annoyed with them when they would ask questions or they would just not be available to them at all. So I think that's very typical to hear. And there's this kind of like old school mentality with old professionals. That's like, I'm only interested in your numbers and nothing else. And they don't care to take the time to ask you questions about how you feel about your numbers or what your goals are and if what we're seeing in your books translates to that. So that's where I've been trying to make that transition to being not the accountant you're scared to call, not the accountant you're scared to ask a question. Um, I want to be approachable. I want to be, you know, and you know this yourself that with my appointments, a lot of them are like 25% business. And then we spend the rest of the time just talking. And um, I like to build that rapport because this is an area that's very sensitive to people. It's very sensitive. It can be very nerve wracking. So I feel like building that comfort and that rapport with my clients helps break down those walls. They're less scared to tell me when they think maybe they're not doing something right. Or if if they are interested in some different kind of money saving strategies and not feeling like I'm going to push back on them. Um, that's what I like to build. So that's where kind of, I like to be the cool accountant and I'm the accountant you actually enjoy going to tax season to talk to because you're going to learn something and you're going to feel good about your direction moving out. You're not going to feel like chastised. What is it about taxes and finances that just make people scared, make people fearful? I mean, there's so much emotion around money, but then when you work with a professional, you lie to them, you hide things from them, or you just get really scared to call them. So like, what is it about that fear and emotion that follows accountants or taxes or finances in general? Yeah, I think everybody, there's just this attachment to our money. That money is emotional. It flows. It's, it's um, people are anxious when it's lacking and people are anxious when it's flowing too, because then they're like, okay, I have all this money now. Am I doing the right things from it? Am I investing in the right things? Am I missing out on certain tax deductions? Um, so that's, I think the anxiety and the, the kind of withholding of it comes from just them not understanding and being afraid to miss out on opportunities but then also afraid to dive into the harder work of, okay, am I going to spend money to hire a professional and figure this out? Or am I going to do the legwork and do the research myself, which is also possible, but you know, it's always easier to pay for something when that's not your forte. Yeah. I mean, I know people listening to the show and I know people personally who do not look at their finances, who don't pay their taxes or they don't pay them on time because they are freaking out about it. And there's no judgment. I really wanted you to come on to sort of like just demystify this fear around all of this. So like what advice would you give to a person who's sitting here really scared to even listen to this episode and start caring about finances, let alone taxes? So this is a motto I live my life day to day with is that we don't know what we don't know. And if we keep ourselves in the spot of we have an anxiety or we have a worry or a fear and our it's stemming from 
the result of that fear of like, okay, I need to pay my taxes, but I'm worried it's going to be too much and I can't afford it. You're still hurting yourself because one, you're going to be late and you're going to incur penalties and interest and fees, and that's more money. And then on the other side, it also goes to your kind of your integrity as a business owner. Like when you take on this responsibility of being a business owner and you you enter that registration on whatever state you're registering for, you're agreeing that you are going to operate your business in line with our country's tax code. So um, when you kind of shrink away from that, you're not only possibly causing yourself more financial damage down the road, but you're kind of also um, hitting on your integrity there. Like, okay, you want to be this business owner. You want your customers to pay you. You want them to take your business seriously. So you need to take your own business seriously. Yeah, I I think that that's super important. I think like there's so many, there's so much anger around taxes. Like a big thing I hear people say, and my friend just said this to me yesterday. She was like, why do I have to pay taxes if people like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos don't have to pay taxes? Like, what do you say to people who are like, I just am so anti-taxes or I don't even want to deal with taxes. Like, what can you tell them to sort of just be like, what kind of truth would you tell them? Well, there's only, there's two things that are certain in this life and it is death and taxes. Um, I can definitely have a long conversation on my thoughts on, you know, how the wealthiest people in this country can get away with what the small business owner cannot. Um, But, you know, my advice for that person would be become that next person and kind of be the change you want to see in this business world. And the first step to that would be to be in compliance yourself. So if you want to get to where Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk is, they got there by following you, you know? Yeah, you're so right. I mean, death and taxes are the only thing. I think it's also like, if you're scared to pay taxes, there's payment plans, like there's things they're not going to, like, are they going to come, if I don't pay my taxes this year, but I, I tell them I can't, they're not going to come to my door and arrest me, right? Like, I think that's no. a stigma too. No, absolutely. There's this kind of idea that the IRS is this big, scary agency that you know, like when people get a letter, they're sending it to me like, oh my God, right. like they said they're going to put a levy. And it's like the, the reality of the IRS right now is they're severely understaffed and underfunded. And a lot of letters that are going out are based on information from months ago that maybe not has, hasn't been updated in their system. So there's always a way to deal with those things. Like you said, if you have a large tax balance, you can go on a payment plan for it. You can put it on a credit card, get some, some points for it. There's options. Like I always try to give my clients the best option for them when they're looking at something like that. And, um, yeah, it's just, if if you want to make money, you got to pay the tax on it. That always is the stipulation of when you're bringing in your money, you they, you have to always have that in the back of your head that 20% of this, you know, I'm just using an, an estimated number, 20% of this is going to go to Uncle Sam. So learning how to operate as a business owner with those taxes already in mind will ease that anxiety of, well, okay, I'm not going to spend the money I don't have. So I'm going to either put this away and not look at it or always know what amount I need to keep in my account, whatever works best for them. Education is just key. Like, like I said, we don't know what we don't know. So once we know that keeping the IRS happy is as simple as, you know, telling them what payment plan we're going to do or pre-planning ahead and saving for your taxes, it's really easy when you don't put so much um, fear behind it and not do the research to find out. Yeah. There's so much that I think people don't know. And there's so many misconceptions. And one of them I found fascinating was that you posted on Instagram that getting a big refund is not necessarily like the best thing. And I know everyone yeah. here, when they hear this, they're going to be waiting for their tax refund. So can you explain what the heck that means? Oh, yeah. And I, I um, you know, tax preparation is just a small piece of what I do as um, an accountant and a bookkeeper. I, um, help clients all year tax plan and do their bookkeeping and their data entry. And um, I was talking to my mom about, you know, taxes are the one thing that gives me kind of the most anxiety here because it's the one thing I really can't control for my client because I don't really, besides what you're hiring me to kind of keep my eye on and help you with, I don't know what else you may be doing over the year. So you may come with something that 
really throws the tax situation off that I can't do anything about. And now I'm being held responsible for it because you're looking at me going, where's my refund? So that's, that's where I kind of want to flip it and go, okay, like this is your situation now. But now that we know this, here's where we can get you with the proper planning, staying on top of, you know, if you are knowing you're getting a large sum of money or something, shoot me a text, shoot me an email, let me know, say, you know, let's do some tax strategy on this. So that's where I try to be the most helpful with my clients. So when they are coming in expecting this large refund um, and they're not getting it, I explain them to why they're not. And sometimes it's because they're owing and because they didn't withhold enough. But when it's small and when you're in that sweet spot of, of just a few hundred bucks, maybe owing a refund, that's where you want to be. Because what that means is you kept most of your money in your pocket that year. You know, where we're, if you're a W-2 employee, your federal withholding that's being taken out all year, that's going to your tax balance. So if you are coming to the end of the year and you're getting a $3,000 refund, that's $3,000 that could have been in your pocket still over the course of the year. So I've done a few um, W-4 reconfigurations with my clients where I'm going, you know, this is where you should be. And I had a client who was getting a $1 refund back and they were excited. They were like, I did it. It's a game. We won. <laughs> okay. This is what was fascinating to me is like everyone growing up is like, I need my refund. I can't wait for my $10,000. And I think, and I might be wrong. The average person like me thinks that like the government is giving you that money, but Am I correct in saying that that is actually your money that you have been paying? It's like you're putting it into like their account and they're giving it back to you? Absolutely. A hundred percent it is. Um, When when we're not considering um, non-refundable credits like um, child tax credit and um, other items, yes, you're withholding when you're just getting back plain withholding. That is your money. That is your own money. It's like when you go and you return a shirt and you get the money back, you're like, ooh, I just made 30 bucks. But it's like, that was your 30 bucks. And I don't think people realize that when we're all like, I can't wait for my refund. But you could have taken that 3000 if it was in your account and invested it somewhere or grew the money elsewhere. So that to me was like a game changing thing to think about is like, we all want a huge refund. But frankly, it's not like we're getting a gift from the government. It's literally like mostly our money back. That's yeah. fascinating to me. Exactly. Exactly. Because we're paying it in over all year. So they're getting to hold it interest free. And then on that tax day, we're doing our job to figure out, you know, here's how much you withheld and here's how much you owed them. And, you know, you're getting back. They're not giving you interest on it. And there's no really incentive to not have that money in your pocket unless you want to use them as like a savings account. But like I said, high yield. High yield savings, put it there instead. This is, that was like one of the most fascinating things I learned this week just by on your Instagram. Like, I, just, <laughs> I didn't know that. And like, I just, I feel like there's so many things about taxes that people don't know. I mean, look, you're a woman in this field, which I think is so amazing because again, I think most people associate the job of being an accountant with a man. What made you want to get into this world? Oof, I tried to avoid this world as hard as I could. So both of my parents are accountants and um, they actually own the firm that I work for, the Gallo Group. Um, I originally started accounting when I was probably like 12 or 13 when my mom, my parents had their office out of our house and my mom would give me a bank statement and she would go, I need you to do the data entry for this. And she would walk through it with me. She'd go, you know, meals, that's a meals and entertainment and gas, that's travel, walking me through a chart of accounts. And I would do that for my allowance money for the weekend. So that's how I first got into it. And I remember being like, I'm not doing this. I don't like this. And when I went to school, I went to school to be a pharmacist. I was, yeah, that was, that was my, uh, that was my major and it kicked my butt. And I was like, okay, no, this is too hard. And I came home from college and my parents were just like, you know, while you're figuring it out, do you want to just work with us for a little bit and, you know, see what you want to do? And I was like, yeah, I took that opportunity and I ended up just being like, no, this is it. This is where I want to be. Um, I never thought I was, I did particularly well in math growing up. So I was like, oh, I'm never going to have 
a job in math, but when you put a dollar sign in front of it, it starts to make new sense to you. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what learning, you know, accounting is not just data entry. There's so much behind it. There's a story that the numbers tell. And that is what has begun to interest me because at my heart of hearts, I do feel like I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm an educator. I love to help people. I love to support people. I love to see the light bulbs go off. So that's where I'm kind of channeling my direction as an accountant is I don't only want to be the accountant who gives you the story of your numbers. I want to tell you the story of your numbers. And um, if your goals are not aligning with those numbers, helping you figure out what is. Yeah, I will say you all are really good at that. Again, like I, I will explain how I know you all in the intro, but I feel like it's more than just accounting and money. It's more of like a family and you guys are our family business, but it's more of the story. It's more of the care. It's more of the, well, let's talk through it. It's not like, here's how much you owe me, Jen. Goodbye. It's never been exactly. like that with you all. And I think that that's huge. Another huge money topic I want to talk to you about is you're planning a wedding. You're getting married this year and being in the field you're in and seeing other people's finances. I mean, what types of lessons did you take from everything you know about money to apply to your own wedding? So it's funny that you say that because I, you know, in what I do, I feel like I do come across as someone who's, you know, would be good with their money, but my own person, I'm like, when I get home, when it's five o'clock, I'm like, I don't even want to look at numbers anymore. So my lovely fiance has actually stepped up and he's kind of the financial arbiter of our home, which is nice. It's nice to have somebody else taking care of that. I see everything. I'm involved. I know what's going on. Um, but he has really taken the forefront in, you know, budgeting for it. And really just what I have really kind of gleaned onto is that what are our priorities? And this was something you kind of talked me through when I first told you I got engaged, like pick three things, pick the three things that are really most important to you. And anything else is really kind of superfluous. So we made a lot of decisive, um, kind of like decisive decisions is that redundant, but we made a lot of decisions about, you know, what we don't need. And like, is this something we want because we want it to be there? Or is this something we, we think other people are going to want to see there? And that's where we kind of divided how we're budgeting for things. So like our top priorities are our food, our entertainment, and the venue. So those are our three things that we were like, we really want to invest in these things. And as long as these things are perfect, everything else can kind of fall into place. So doing the all-inclusive event um, venue with Destination was really useful in that because we have our basic things that are included and then we can build where we want. So that's kind of like to apply that in the accounting sense and in your business, like pick your three things. Pick your three things that are the most important to you that you want to cultivate. You want to cultivate your systems and processes to run smoothly. You want to cultivate your customer base and your advertising. You want to cultivate, you know, your social media presence. Pick those things that are important to you and drive most of your um, funding there. And then everything else, if you are really driving, especially with the advertising, everything else will fall into place. So um, I'm really into the idea of kind of creating categories and buckets in your business. And, you know, especially for taxes, taxes is one I'm like mandatory with my clients of you have to have a bucket, but then choose whatever else is left. Like, what is it that you want to make sure your business is funded in and make sure you're saving and putting aside money for those things all year. And you'll always be able to do that. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. I think it applies to taxes and everything in life when you're planning. And I have to say, like, you're taking this interview in the heart of tax season. It is March 17th and you are doing this interview. So everyone has the reputation of tax season being so crazy, so wild. What are some of the ways that you get through it personally and just take care of yourself during the busiest time of year for yourself? Yeah. And I remember growing up, like my parents would have these long nights, like they wouldn't be home until like 8 p.m. or they would have clients over until so late. And I always like kind of knew in my head that that wasn't the professional lifestyle that I wanted. 
and we don't necessarily need it. Like even in corporate accounting, you know, there's these high expectations that you need to be working until midnight. You need to always be answering your phones. Your clients need an immediate answer. And I just don't apply that philosophy to my business and how I um, operate. Um, I really prioritize my self-care because I realized if I'm not operating at full function, I cannot be there fully present for my clients. And one thing I've really learned is nothing is an emergency unless it's a fire. And luckily within accounting, there are not many fire hazards. So there's nothing that kind of gets thrown at me and even to my clients. And I have to kind of calm them down because everything seems urgent if it comes attached with a letter or a deadline or a penalty, but everything can be fixed. Everything can be fixed. Um, you know, forgiveness can be requested and plans can be made. So I always try to operate not from this sense of urgency, which is kind of typical in accounting and more from a sense of like planning and knowing, you know, when we need to freak out, which is not often and kind of um, cultivating a more relaxed atmosphere around this industry. You know, it's so funny. Every time I open my mail and get a letter from the IRS, I have a full on panic attack. I'm like, oh, of course. To, I'm like, I have to send it to Katie. It's all over. They're coming for me. And you're just like, it's not a big deal. Like the letter's wrong half the time or something, you know? But yeah, like, I'm like, I got this. I'll call them. <laughs> but like overnight, I'm like, oh my God. Like, is it? But you know what? You're right. Like, most of the time, it's not a big deal. But we are just so programmed to see the three letters IRS. Even Adam will be like, is that from the IRS? You know, it's just like, it's just so scary scary, but I do appreciate the calming sense that you have because it balances out the people on the other end who are like, oh my God, is the world ending? And you're like, no, it's absolutely not. No, no. The worst, the worst that can come out of it is you have to cough up some money and, you know, it's usually a result of taxable activity you have. So I kind of, I like to walk through people through it and understanding the origins of where any letters or penalties or fees may have come from yeah. just to go back to the responsibility of being in a business owner aspect, you know, yeah. you knowing this is helping you in the future to avoid it. But um, there's always, you know, penalties can be requested for forgiveness and yeah. there's always a way to deal with something. There's always a way to make the IRS happy. And that's, that's, I always, whenever a client comes to me like urgent and like really agitated, I nine times out of 10, they leave that call going, oh, whew, okay, we're good. Yeah. So that's what I like to hear. That's what I like to do. I have another question for you. I end all my interviews with this question. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. So fill in the blank. You're not getting any younger. So. So I would say never stop learning, never stop learning and never think that you're in a place where you you're done and you know it all. Um, I think that, oh, there's the puppy behind me, <laughs> the little Shiva. Um, I, think um, what's most important in that message is just there's always going to be something you don't know and things are changing constantly. So always be in a position where you're ready to pivot or do something different or change the way you do something because it will be more beneficial to you. And then another thing I would say is um, identify what your weaknesses are and hire them. Hire them in a coach, hire them in a an accountant in a financial advisor in something. Um, I think what's most important for business owners to have is a team that supports them. So um, in every way, mental, fiscally, um, emotionally, um, it's really easy to get burned out and to think that all you need to do is, you know, work, work, work and build, 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 but you're a human being too. And um, if you're ever in a place where you feel like you need support, don't be afraid to ask for it. Yeah. Amen to that. Don't try to do it all, especially if there's people out there who can do it better than you and know more than you. And it's not something you want to learn. Okay. Tell everyone where they can find out more about you and the Gallo group and all your information. So you can find our website at www.thegallogroup.net. My Instagram is Katie, K-A-T-I-E, G-A-L-L-O underscore G-R-O-U-P. So that's Katie Gallo underscore group. And um, I haven't been posting much because it is tax season, but I do have a lot of fun things planned. I want to get back on there. Um, we are doing some very exciting things as far as 
building our advising services to be more robust. So there's a lot more support coming for any um, existing and new clients. So you'll be excited to see that too. And um, yeah, that's it. That is amazing. Yeah, I really miss your Instagram reels. It's so they're so <laughs> fun and the content is I'm telling you, I learned so much just through the Instagram account. So definitely follow Katie. Yeah, I'll link to all of that and reach out to them. I mean, I've been working with the Gala group for literally the entire time I've had a business. So over seven years, and it has been incredible. I mean, even though Adam and I are married, we're still filing taxes individually, and I'm still using the Gala <laughs> group. I'm like, you do your own thing. But They've just been amazing. And I live in New York, Katie's in Florida, and I'm still a client. So it doesn't matter where you live, like reach out, especially if you are a small business and definitely learn more. They're the least scary people I've ever met in this industry. So you'll love talking to them. Thank you so much, Jen. We appreciate you and your whole family so much. Yes. And thank you so much for being on the show. Of course. Thank you. Hey, you. Thank you for listening to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of pods out there, so thank you for listening to this one. You can find the show notes for this week's episode up on our website, anyyounger.com. Subscribe, rate, and review that you're not getting any younger podcasts on iTunes so that other ears around the world can listen to. Oh, and join our secret You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group, where over 1,000 people are talking about how to disrupt their lives for a good reason, to make it count. Until next week, all my love, Jen Glantz.